I want to talk about shaping the unseen, the history of the universe. So what do we know about the history of the universe? Well, we know that it is 13.8 billion years old, that the Earth and the Sun are one-third that age, 4.6 billion, um, that there has been life on Earth for most of that time. Uh, we know that there's about one billion years left here on Earth before the Sun gets a little too hot for us, uh, where no matter how good we are with our climate change management, uh, it'll be a problem. So we've got uh, about a billion years, and I ask you to work with me to ensure that civilization lasts at least that long and longer if possible. So uh, that's our challenge, and I want you to think with me about what that might take. So there's a lot to think about. So I start with a mystery. Uh, how did this happen? This is my family, my mother and my dad and my sister and me. And if you look at that and you say, where did we come from? Well, we all sort of know. We've been looking into our genealogy. We know about our near ancestors. We've read the history books. We've heard the geology stories. We sort of have an idea. Uh, but it doesn't all hang together yet because there are a lot we don't know. And uh, that's been part of my quest all my life. When I was about six, uh, that guy there told me that human beings, living things, are made out of cells that those cells have chromosomes in them with genes, and they uh, control our fate. So how did that happen? Well, in uh, 1952 or so, we didn't know yet. We didn't even know about the double helix. Um, but I was fascinated. How does this work? So I ended up becoming a cosmologist, sort of by happenstance, not necessarily by conscious intention. Uh, but um, this was my challenge, and I want to share a progress report with you on how that goes. So how did my dad know about that? Well, he was a geneticist himself. He was working on dairy cows, so he'd have more and better milk. My mother was a school teacher. Her job was to make sure that first, year, first, year, first grade students would all be able to read at the end of her class, which they could. So my sister is a teacher now, retired. Uh, so we've got a problem here. How do we understand the forces of the universe? Uh, we've got a big idea. And then you look around in the details, and there's just no way to explain how that happened. So I'll start with cosmology. This is something we actually do know something about. Um, this is the uh, Big Bang Theory illustrated for you. Um, we know uh, the early universe was extremely hot and extremely compressed uh, and extremely dense. Uh, and uh, from uh, math and measurements, we think that there was no center and no edge. Uh, that the whole universe is infinite in extent, unimaginably large, just unimaginably large, uh, that it's been expanding and cooling down and doing different things from that very hot condition. Um, and we call it the Big Bang, although that's a completely pathetically inadequate name. Uh, because when you think of it, you hear, a, you think, oh, a firecracker. The opposite is true. This is the entire infinite universe expanding into itself and um, that seems to be what we've got, although it's so contrary to all our intuition that we hardly believe it. So we have to have a humor show on TV about it, which is uh, actually convincing vast numbers of people to become scientists, technologists, engineers, and mathematicians. <laughs> so it's cool to be a, a, a STEM person these days, partly because of the Big Bang, uh, which is misnamed. At any rate, um, so how did that happen? Well, the uh, expanding material uh, somehow turned into the particles that we see today. We know the world that we have is made out of protons, neutrons, electrons, uh, a few neutrinos, uh, um, light waves, um, cosmic dark matter, which we've recognized but can't find. Um, so, but then, then what? So, um, what are the forces that make this work? Where does the complexity of modern life come from this sort of simple story that I just told you? Well. We got our first clue from measurements with our satellite, the Cosmic Background Explorer satellite, where we measured that the Big Bang is not the same everywhere. Uh, this is a better map that was taken by a later satellite team. At any rate, we know that the Big Bang was not uniform. There were hot and cold spots. And here's a map. So it's not entirely true that you can't see history, because we're seeing the universe as it was when it was young. This is a baby picture of the universe, uh, and it has hot and cold spots. Um, and what they actually mean is there are dense regions and less dense regions. So what does that matter? It means that gravity, which is the same force that would make this fall on the floor and uh, achieve kinetic energy from 
from potential energy is the same force that made us appear in a very indirect way. Uh, gravity acting on those spots is able to stop the expansion of the material and make it collapse back down into stuff, into stars and galaxies. So if the gravity works long enough, hard enough, on a, a, uh, some of that primordial material, we'll end up with a star, and, this, and the center of the star will come up to millions of degrees of temperature, and nuclear reactions will be ignited in the star, and so that's how come uh, we are here. When Stephen Hawking saw our first picture, he said it was the most important scientific discovery of the century, if not of all time. And uh, I didn't right away understand why that was so important. But if, it, if those spots were not there, we would not be here. And we even know now that most of those spots come from the cosmic dark matter, which astronomers can recognize and nobody else can see. Uh, and so we wouldn't even be here without dark matter. So we're, this is uh, more important than you might think. So this is what uh, gravity operating uh, with uh, nuclear power has done. This is a galaxy pretty much like the Milky Way that we live in. Uh, it's held uh, in its spiral shape by gravity, pulling the stars into the center. The stars are initially formed by gravity, and then nuclear reactions power them. The sun is our great nuclear power source in the sky, free power distribution every day. Uh, but anyway, that's where it's happening in another galaxy like ours. If, our, if we were there in that galaxy, we would be orbiting around the outside edge somewhere. Um, and that might tell us something about where life might exist, but we don't know. Uh, so that's a near, pretty nearby neighbor and uh, part of our situation. So um, then, um, after that, what happens? Um, we've got nuclear power running, making the stars burn. This happens. Stars blow up. So what makes them blow up? Gravity makes them do it. After the uh, star has used up most of its nuclear fuel and the hydrogen has turned into helium, and the helium has been burned into heavier elements, up to iron, um, and it hasn't got any fuel left, the star has to change shape. Something will happen. It will blow up or it will start spitting material back out into space. So this happened in AD 1054. It's a star called the Crab Nebula now. It was observed the day that it blew up because you could see it from the ground in the daytime. Uh, so uh, this is the beginning of the next force that uh, moves the universe. This is the uh, beginning of chemistry because this is when the chemical elements come back out into space uh, and can then be turned into the next generation of whatever may happen next. So uh, all the chemical elements of ourselves were liberated into space in explosions like that. We are here because of those. So we're totally recycled. Our atoms have been hundreds of millions of light years out into space and fallen back in, all controlled by gravity, and now chemistry is possible because of that. So here's a picture of a solar system being born. Uh, this was taken quite recently uh, with a new telescope in South America. Uh, and what's happening in the middle, there's a star being born in the middle, and what we see orbiting around are clouds of dust grains. The, the dust grains made well, like the dust in the house, only sand mostly and carbon. Um, and they are in the process of getting turned into planets. So those dark spaces in between the glowing clouds of dust grains, that's where there's new planets being born. So we think, uh, and this picture matches almost exactly with the theoretical predictions that people made. So how are planets made? Sort of like that. So the beginning of chemistry uh, acting to make planets like ours, we also know that uh, a lot of debris is left over from a thing like that. It doesn't all suddenly glom into nine neat little planets. Uh, there's comets and asteroids left over. So imagine that this uh, proceeds for a few more million years. Um, there will be planets like Earth in there probably, and they will be pelted by comets and asteroids for hundreds of millions of years, which is important because this is how we get water on the surface of the Earth, the young Earth, and it's how um, the chemical elements that we need, carbon and oxygen, which are pretty volatile, um, are brought to the Earth after the Earth is formed. So uh, that's part of our history or something a lot like our history. So then we come to a, a totally astonishing uh, discovery that nature has made. Uh, we don't know how this happened. We, this is the beginning, or the, this is a symbolic of the beginning of life here on Earth. We do know that it happened quite quickly. Uh, within a few hundred million years after the bombardment from the sky ended and we had oceans on the surface, we have chemical evidence and fossil evidence that this has already occurred. Nobody knows how it happened, nobody knows where it happened, 
It's pretty astonishing. Um, we have an idea, by the way. There's a thing called a hydrothermal vent at the bottom of the ocean, many places where hot water is bubbling up from underneath the ground and meeting up with cold ocean water and makes very complex structures, physical structures and little chimneys. And if you were a chemist and you were designing a reactor to try to produce life, it would be a good try, place to try. So maybe that's where it happened. Um, but this is an almost complete mystery. Now this is the first digital revolution. It's, it's sort of revolving in the animation there, but what I mean is um, there's a digital code in the, in the sequence of things that are in the rungs of that ladder. And there's four different letters that can be making up the rungs of that ladder, and the sequence carries a message. So we know now sort of what the message means, because we've been doing this for a long time. Um, we don't know quite how the original cell figured that out. So not only did this digital code originate promptly after it could, but also the thing that reads the code also originated back then, and this is a huge mystery. So all we really can guess is that um, either a miracle happened or uh, an extraordinary number of experiments were done by nature and f some of them worked. So um, another curious thing is all living things share the same code. Our cells read the same code, it means the same thing. So bacteria read our genes, we can read bacterial genes. Um, and that's one of the reasons the biotechnology has been so powerful lately. So we don't know how, how it happened, but it has led to us some way, uh, astonishing way. Uh, Darwin told us the basic idea that uh, things that were better suited for a new environment would survive better, and, but the enormous number of steps, at least 40 different uh, major transitions had to be discovered by nature for this to occur. So anyway, here we are um, as a result of four billion years of this. Uh, and this has led to us. We are different from the other critters uh, in pretty important ways. Um, not, well, anyway, we can do this. We can throw something. We can carry something with our hands. Um, we can make a tool. We can talk. Uh, we can write. Uh, and other critters could maybe begin. We know that dogs can hear and they can understand. They can watch us. They know how we're feeling. Um, they watch our eyes. We watch each other's eyes. We're totally obsessed with each other. Uh, why do we go and buy gossip magazines? We're obsessed with each other. So we're what we call hypersocial. Well, dogs are kind of hypersocial too. So probably they're our nearest companions for a good reason. Um, anyway, this creature is now able to accumulate knowledge over many thousands of years. People that look like us or have skeletons like ours have been walking around on Earth for about 200,000 years. And curiously enough, our population was down to about 300 people at one time and is now up to 7 billion. So we must be doing something right, uh, but we also under came, uh, we were extraordinarily close to our own personal extinction a long time ago. So how does this all work? What is going to happen next? Uh, well, we discovered the power of the word to create abstract entities. Um, in 1776, uh, 56 people signed this document and they created the United States. So that's pretty amazing. We've almost created a living thing. We've created an entity which is not biological, which exists because we created it from words and because we backed it up, of course, with a little bit of fighting. Uh, and um, later on, we wrote our DNA code, the Constitution, that tells us how to proceed and how our organization will go. We even wrote the sec secret decoder in there and says there is a court system um, that uh, interprets the Constitution. So we created a new kind of entity, the abstract object, the being of, that we can only make with words. Now, I don't know if other critters would understand these words eventually. You could imagine in the future, we won't be the only ones that are smart enough to read those words. Um, so anyway, we've created this. Uh, we've discovered ourselves uh, that we are alone in our little planet. Um, by the way, this uh, represents several kinds of power. One is the power of conflict. Uh, we, the United States, sent our Apollo astronauts out into space because we did not actually want to shoot at the Soviet Union. Uh, we wanted to prove how powerful we were, so we didn't have to shoot. And it worked, but it also reminded us of how alone we are and how this is the only planet we have anywhere nearby. So we learned that, and we now are moving on to a new revolution. This is where Apple is building their uh, new headquarters in Cupertino, California. And this is the electronic super connection. 
Uh, we are now instantly able to talk to practically everyone in the world, and in another few decades, it's hard to imagine anybody will out, be out of reach of instant connection. Um, this is now enabling a new kind of life form to occur, which is the online life form. The, the social media that we are now using, um, they've begun to take a life of their own. Uh, you can have a, uh, a social media presence that can kill you. So this is new, not new life form occurring. It's also enabling us to do the most amazing creative things. If you have an idea, within seconds you can have a friend who has the same idea. Uh, if you want to buy something, within seconds you can find out that somebody else is making it. So we have gone from something that took thousands of years to communicate by walking to something where it takes seconds to communicate to somebody else who can help us do what we want. So we are now able to do the most astonishing things. We can engineer anything we want. Um, we can solve all of the technical engineering problems that we see in the world um, because we have seven billion customers for this kind of system. Uh, I don't know how many engineers work there, but it's seven billion customers, that is to say everybody on planet Earth is signing into this. So what is this going to mean? I do not know, but basically there are so many of us here that if it can be done, it will be done because we are all over it. This is like, why do the ants find all the sugar in my house? They look everywhere. We're going to do that too. So, which brings me to what are we going to do about it? Um, I like to look at this guy because he was special and different. Not only was he a scientist and engineer, he was also a master of creating organizations and thinking about human nature and human, human uh, character. So he started self-help organizations. He started the um, first American Scientific Society. He started the fire department in Philadelphia. He started so many things. Uh, and many of his organizations are still going. So he was able to create an organization that would have a life of its own, the power of the word, backed up by the idea and the commitment and the sharing and the things that you've heard about today. Um, he did it too. Um, he even ran the post office, which was like the internet of uh, colonial America. He got weekly mail delivery. That's pretty amazing. That was the internet of his time. So what was he specially interested in? He was interested in character. He had his list of 13 virtues and he tried to cultivate them, a different one each day. Uh, he knew that character was important. He knew about the vision that we have to have for our future. He helped us create that. So I would say, okay, Ben, if you were here today, what would you be doing? You would be helping us think about wh what to do so we can have a world that we would like to have. would have respect for the individual, respect for creativity, respect for human rights, uh, respect for our differences. So it would be safe and happy for us to walk wherever we go and have a, a view that will lead us to be able to manage our planet together. Thank you.